But your knowledge is impressive for cardiology. Deficiency in a hormone, that would affect the heart. Heart disease, and then how testosterone and other hormones might be able to help it or hurt it or what we have to look out for. So what a lot of people do, particularly in the medical profession, is that we've got a medical degree. You're talking nonsense. You're not allowed. Shut up. That's what they do. That's completely the wrong thing to do. Art is very much the conductor of this orchestra because it is responsible for pumping blood around the body. It's very important to understand that the body is a set of interdependent organ systems. And one of the big mistakes we make is where we see each organ in isolation. Oh, this is heart, this is not gut, and therefore there's no connection. And that is clearly not true. One decision some patients reach a kind of a fork in the road is they're you know, getting to be up to 30, 35. They're not feeling like well as they used to. Uh, maybe we have a touch of ED, lack of libido, and, and they're thinking, hey, I've heard about this testosterone treatment. Maybe I, I ought to get tested for testosterone and see if I have a deficiency. But then they've been scared by the GP to say, oh, no, that will give you a heart attack or a stroke, uh, raise your cholesterol. So I mean, what, what, what do we tell patients that are looking for testosterone? Now, we know, as we have Balancer Hormones, the company, the, the clinic, the pharmacy, um, we, you know, we're up to date with the latest studies. Uh, I think we talked about the Traverse study, which is 5,000 patients involved in that study who already had cardiac disease were put on testosterone gel, which is probably one of the worst treatments, and found that there was no negative effect on heart health. I think there's like a, just a, a rare, just a couple of patients had uh, pulmonary embolism. One, I think, had AFib, and another had... I can't remember, but it, it wasn't, it was kind of scrubbed from the data. It wasn't really that significant of, of an event. So overall, the message was, you know, testosterone is safe for the heart when it's given for people who need it and when it's given with the gel. But I would argue, based on some subset of the data, we did a video we put up here about one of the subsets of the data said that, oh, but testosterone treatment will lead to further osteoporosis, which I think they, they drew the wrong conclusion or they were underdosed on that. You know, if you have, yeah. if you don't have enough testosterone treatment, you're not going to get enough estrogen. Estrogen protects the bone. So just like that subset of this tra traverse study, yes, there was no negative effect on the heart, but it could have been a more beneficial effect if they looked at different injections rather than gels. Could it have been more beneficial, you know, if the dose was a little, or the end range, because they only would let people be on the study if there were, were no higher than 700 nanograms per deciliter, which, you know, isn't that high really. And they would take patients off. So it would have been interesting to see if they kept those patients on the study to see if they would have had even better results as far as health outcomes. But I just, you know, in general, we, we talked before you've been on the channel about testosterone and it's, it's benefits to the heart, not just for cardiovascular, but for, I think for heart failure, I guess, dilated cardiac myopathy, AFib, what, yeah, maybe we kind of review that. I did uh, quite a lot of reading around testosterone because I wanted to educate myself about it. I also became interested in the fact that actually, when I was doing my reading, I found that low testosterone appeared to be associated with more AF, people with heart failure tended to have more lower testosterone levels compared to, you know, age match, age match controls. And a lot of the symptoms of things like fatigue, et cetera, et cetera, could also be explained by a degree of testosterone uh, deficiency. So, and so I think, again, you know, we should be encouraged certainly to look for it. Secondly, I think it's also important not to just stick with, oh, these are the recommended guidelines, because there are subclinical things. You know, they're, they're, you can have subclinically low things. If you're demonstrating symptoms, which may be in keeping with, and your testosterone rides sort of on the lower edges of what is the normal range, then I think we should be sort of a little bit more proactive. And, and my reading has not shown anything which makes me think that, oh, testosterone is horrendously... From what I've discovered, you know, read on guidelines, uh, not guidelines, but um, research papers, review articles, etc. I think that those people who have testosterone deficiency really do benefit, you know, in terms of quality of life. And there's no really good data to say that, oh, this is a no-no. I, th I think that's, that's really refreshing to hear because so many times, I mean, even when they did these studies, I mean, the reason why they would have capped the testosterone level at 700 because it's quite ignorant on their part. They were afraid that they would be causing harm 
in, in their thinking if someone went over 700. And I don't know where this comes from because you know, naturally we've seen patients, luckily they didn't need testosterone treatment, that their levels were higher. Or occasionally you'll see patients with higher levels of total testosterone, but it's the free. And so it's very nuanced in, in the sense that um, you can't just look at levels, and, and you, you alluded to that, but also you know, the range of total is one thing. There's also the calculated free, as, as they use in the clinical studies, but there's also something called CAG repeat. So there's some people who genetically are more sensitive to testosterone than others. So in, in the genome of the androgen receptor, if they're long CAG repeats, they seem to be more resistant to testosterone. Therefore, they require higher amounts, either endogenously or exogenously. And those who have short CAG repeats are more sensitive, and therefore they, they might not need as much. And the, the, these guys are usually ones that probably won't have the symptoms. They won't come and say, hey, I, I need to get a blood test because they probably feel absolutely fine, even if the levels are maybe closer to that, you know, five or 700 nanograms per deciliter. So it's really interesting that I think the people who do the research, reading to do, go back to school and do more research or really look into it before they just start throwing out these assumptions on, on the studies. Unfortunately, this is what happens. You know, there's all the journal or a newspaper will publish a headline news. And then before you know it, this uh, whole field sort of becomes unpopular and so gets stigmatized and, uh, and maybe we do our patients a disservice. You know, it, as you say, it has to be nuanced. It has to be further research. You always try and say, okay, well, this is what we found. How can we look a little bit further? How can we be a bit more sophisticated and identify? Because if you found a deficiency, it's certainly worth looking into it. We do know that obviously testosterone has other benefits, doesn't it, for, for, for the body? It's, uh, it has a vasodilat vasodilatory role. When I read, I came across small studies which suggested that those people who were getting AF, if you gave them, if we replaced their testosterone, their AF got better. So that, to my mind, is the interesting side of medicine where we start looking at this and saying, okay, on the basis of this, I just need to be more aware. I just need to be more alert to this. If nothing else, I just need to, you know, until further data come out, what I'm not going to do is poo-poo the idea. Yeah. You know, that's that's the wrong thing because a lot of times people do that out of ignorance. You know, it's not because they're really well read on it. It's because they've read the headline or they've just heard someone else say, that, oh, no, 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 that's a very bad thing. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of doctors who are uneducated in specific subjects. The biggest argument they make for the testosterone is that, oh, well, testosterone, which if you're anemic is a good thing, it will raise your red blood cells, your erythrocytosis. Yeah. If you're not, and you're on testosterone, and sometimes the level gets a bit high, you can get increased uh, hematocrit, hemoglobin. Yeah. But then you can also get this from NAC. You know what NAC is? It's the supplement that, and acetylcysteine, yeah, that in some cases can also raise hemoglobin in a short period of time, in about eight days. The question really with all these is, does it result in bad things? That's the more important thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, but does it result in bad things? And my my reading, when I last read, it didn't seem that there was a huge, in, there was a significant increase in this. So I, no, I think I remember there was worries about prostate cancer. There's yeah. been no convincing evidence. There was worries about blood clots. And there was a study by Ramaswamy. 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 It, it published one on, yeah. on the erythrocytosis. Yeah. And it just came out this year. And, I, and it, but it was a retrospective study. So they looked at people, I think on insurance, who were receiving prescriptions for testosterone. And then those who had an elevated hematocrit, stroke hemoglobin, found a slightly higher incidence of uh, some cardiovascular events on, on those cases. But I don't think that was a very, I mean, I like Dr. Ramasamy and, and he's quite knowledgeable in lots of things, testosterone, but he was only one of the authors, by the way. So it must've been the other authors that put some bad comments in. I'm not sure what, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, because especially it goes counter to what the Traverse study has shown, which was much larger, which was an interventional study. They took the worst of the worst cardiovascular patients with cardiovascular incidents, and they didn't see the same outcome. So they're trying to make the assumption that the elevation of hematocrit and hemoglobin sometime, somehow puts you at, at a greater risk of some sort of cardiovascular event. And this is why it's just so incredibly important that someone gets in, does a proper study and answers that question once and for all. Because if it doesn't do you harm, yes. then it's okay to use it for quality of life purposes. Yeah. Because the patient will come and say, since I started this, I feel better. Or since I started this, it's not made any difference, in which case you stop it. But if they feel better, great, you've made a difference. Yeah. But to not even give them that option because of yeah. 
because of fear, yeah. which has not been properly, you know, th those, those concerns have not been properly researched. Mm. They should be answered, shouldn't they? Someone should do a proper study, answer that question, is it harmful? And if it is not, then I think that in some way frees everyone to say, okay, well, try it and see what happens to you. Does it make a difference or not? So I can't understand that. I can't understand why we end up depriving patients who, who's, you know, where mainstream medicine is not actually helping them to improve their quality of life on the basis of some kind of fear that has not even been properly... No, it's not, it's not healthy, not helpful for the patient. Yeah. So on, on the going back to the erythrocytosis, it's always misquoted. Like they always use the wrong terminology. They love to put uh, polycythemia vera, which is not what it is. It's erythrocytosis secondary to testosterone treatment. And the question then is that going to be dangerous? So some of the guidelines for you know, treatment of testosterone are if those levels we can get over fifty four percent hematocrit, and don't forget hematocrit can vary based on your MCV, and if and the blood tests are sitting around too long, or if you super hydrate before the test, I know this happened to me, it swells the blood uh, cells, and now you get this large MCV value, which gets multiplied by the red cell count, it divided by hundred, and that gives you your hematocrit. That's how hematocrit isn't a direct measurement; it's a calculation. Obviously, hemoglobin plays into it, but yeah, it's it's one of those things where. The guidance talks about either reducing the dose, because sometimes the, the trough level, the level at the lowest point of the free testosterone is a great predictor of how much increase you'll get. And we've seen some patients who we just have to change the treatment modality. They used to say the, 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 uh, the topicals would cause less erythrocytosis, but then you're also getting a whole lot less testosterone in the first place, and you may not be getting any of the benefit. Um, some patients may, but a vast majority don't, because we see that in our clinic. And the other benefit, uh, and the other... Uh, modality that we have is uh, short-acting testosterone uh, propionate, which is kind of in and out of the system very quickly, which you can dose every other day or every day. And, and that seems to not, we don't see as many patients. So patients who have suffered with high levels of erythrocytosis secondary to the testosterone treatment, they, they, we see a normalization of their levels when they're put on that. And then occasionally the doctor will also say, according to the guidelines, guidelines again, use a bit of a baby aspirin, or then there's the therapeutic phlebotomy. Now, I mean, do you see any risks in uh, an occasional therapeutic phlebotomy other than if you do it too much, you deplete the ferritin. But if you yeah. do it on the cycle of a, a normal blood donation cycle, which is like every three months, it's a nice thing to do, well, if they'll take your blood, so if they're firstly. But even if you didn't, you know, I think, would that be reasonable every three months or? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think so. I mean, I think, I think the important question really is, does it make a difference to that patient's quality of life? And what does that difference look like? I'm very much not for giving people stuff, regardless of whether it's medication or supplements or anything, you know, because, because that's also a fallacy to think, okay, well, all medicines are bad and every natural thing is good. That's all, you know, because unfortunately, wherever you are, an industry will build up and every industry is out there to promote their product. And I'm very much for, we should be open, we should be receptive to everything and we should work with the patient and say, see their feedback does it make things better? And if, if something does make it better, and if as long as the patient, as long as there's good research to say it's not dangerous and that it's not horrendously expensive where someone's ripping someone off, uh, then, then why not? Speaking of making some patients feel better, sometimes on testosterone treatment, patients will have an elevated prolactin. Now, elevated prolactin could be a cause of um, hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. so, and, and that could be out of work. You can have elevated prolactin if you have an adenoma in, in your yeah. brain. That's the more, more traditional one. Some patients who are on SSRI medications along yeah. with their testosterone. Sometimes patients who are on testosterone treatment will get a, an elevation in estradiol or along with the SSRI or just estradiol on their own will cause the, uh, quite a high amount or a high normal amount of prolactin. And there have been studies that show high normal levels of prolactin may not be good for the body as far as cardiovascular risk, as far as... Yeah diabetes as far as metabolic syndrome. Some even go as far as saying potentially uh, androgenetic alopecia might be linked to elevated prolactin in the body, and they're looking at prolactin antibodies to, to reduce it throughout the body, not just the brain, but throughout the rest of the body, and that may show some benefit in, in hair loss. We'll see after watch the space. But the question, so what we have as far as the tools now are quite dirty old tools like the ergots. Cabogaline is, is probably yeah. the most common one and probably one of the more preferential treatments that are used. 
and and it needs to be used cautiously because in the uh, like the mid noughties uh, they had discovered in some Parkinson patients that uh, they were seeing some valvular damage. Yeah, and they've ascribed this to this receptor, a serotonin receptor, and I guess SSRIs also. Some of them also hit this this receptor. It's called the five H T two B receptor, and this cabergolin is uh, an agonist of this, as well as a dopamine D2 agonist. Yeah. But it does a nice job of lowering the prolactin, and the patient really only needs to take it once a week, or once every two weeks, or every 10 days. And you, you know, at a very tiny amount, brings it, brings it down. Not in all patients, but some of those patients who suffer it, and some of the sexual medicine societies talk about when patients are refractory to the testosterone therapy alone, fixing their sexual libido desire, sometimes this, this can help. I guess the question is if, you know, what have you found in your research, you know, as a cardiologist? I mean, you know, most of the data that I've seen says it's, it's a minimal, minimal issue. Absolutely. So the, the issue was that uh, in uh, patients who were prescribed cabergolin in uh, Parkinsonian patients, they were taking, I think, 3,000 milligrams, uh, dose, dose of 3,000 milligrams. Cumulative dose, yeah. So, yeah. With uh, prolactinomas, etc., the dose is only one to two milligrams uh, a week. I think it is. If, if that, I mean, well, a, a Parkinsonian patients is more. I mean, if you're prolactin patients, I mean, I think it's um, a quarter of a, of a milligram yeah, once or twice a week. Yeah. And and the the issue was that about twenty six percent of the patients in the Parkinsonian group that were getting the really high doses they discovered that they had uh, leaky valves which were uh, stiffer yeah. and more sort of restricted. Uh, calcified, weren't they? Calcified. Yeah. But not just, not just thicker, but more calcified. More calcified, thicker, and regurgitant. That was the triad. And that's where concerns about cabergolin came. People have looked at studies where for the doses that are used in hyperprolactinemia, prolactinomas, and no one's really found a significant... You know, There's like a couple of case studies, yeah, but... but, but Nothing. They love this. They love flashing around those case studies and scaring everyone. <laughs> and, and, and they say they would take up to thirty years for you to get to the cumulative dose that was used in the Parkinsonian patients. So, to my mind, it's not really a big thing from what I have read. Uh, yeah. Would, would you, if if there were a patient already for for other causes? Because what are the other causes of thickening of the valves? What what else can cause a high blood pressure? Yeah, high blood wear and tear, high blood pressure, rheumatic rheumatic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, uh, or, or heart failure cause uh, thickening. Not as far as we know, but certainly things like rheumatic fever could cause it, and wear and tear, or if you've actually had an abnormal valve to start with. So those. And, and if a patient already has a, a, a mild thickening of, of the valve, should they? But they have these other problems with high prolactin. You could just keep an eye on it. And, and they can yeah. still use the cabergolin. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think so. Because at the end of the day, you know, the, the elevated prolactin itself is harmful. So you want to... You Minimize that, yeah. You can just monitor the things. Because I, I, I know in, in, um, in heart failure patients, women with postpartum heart failure, they, they're given the cabergolin uh, as a treatment. To, you know, I guess that's a shorter period of time, but uh, still it's um, something to consider. So, oh, that's, that's interesting. I thought we'd we'd address it. We have the cardiologist on, and, and you seem to very knowledgeable about, about all these. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I didn't come across much of this uh, often, but I have become more and more interested in the role of hormones in the heart. Uh, so I came across that. And uh, certainly from what I had read, I couldn't see any major issues with cabergolin, uh, particularly in hyperprolactinemia. So if you're considering testosterone replacement therapy, TRT, why not reach out to one of our doctors at Balance My Hormones, where you can get just a simple advice call for only $59.95. Also, whilst you're watching the channel, don't forget to subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell so you get the latest content from Balance My Hormones. Until next time, this is Mike, and wishing you the best of health.